Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Tessa Blackstone and I chair the board of the British Library. I'd like to welcome you all tonight. Um, I do want to say just two or three things about the British Library. Um, we are, of course, really a world library, not just a, a national library. Um, we have more than 150 million items and they relate to many, many different languages, many different faiths, many different literatures. Uh, and we see it as our job now to try to spread uh, access to these extraordinary collections. So we have a huge digitization program, not as big as it should be, uh, because if uh, we could possibly get even a tiny proportion of those 150 million items digitized, uh, many more people would be able to read them online all over the world. Uh, but we will go on struggling to do more of that. Uh, we are also uh, friends of many of the uh, 53 countries that are part of the Commonwealth uh, in their national libraries. Uh, we work with them in a variety of different ways, uh, including looking at things like endangered archives and helping with conservation um, and using our own knowledge and expertise and sharing it. Uh, I want to just say one other thing. Our next two exhibitions are both uh, relevant to the Commonwealth. Um, the first is an exhibition on James Cook and his voyages. This is a very big exhibition opening next week. Uh, and it will uh, tell us, I think, a great deal about uh, both how exploration took place uh, in the uh, 18th century uh, and what he found when he got to the amazing countries that he eventually reached. Uh, the second exhibition is a smaller one, and it's about the Windrush generation, very much in the news at the moment. I'm afraid, uh, in some ways, not very good news. Um, but uh, I hope as many of you as possible will be able to come to both those exhibitions and that you will enjoy, enjoy them. Uh, we've got a fantastic panel tonight, uh, and I'm delighted to welcome all three of them here. But I'm going to hand over now to Rita Chakrabarty, um, who is a well-known BBC presenter, and she's going to chair the proceedings and introduce the panellists. Thank you. Thank you, Tessa, and thank you to you all for sticking the course with the fire alarm, and it's a lovely evening outside, and you've elected to come here, so that really is great. We are here to talk about the state of the Commonwealth, um, as the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting was officially open today in London. This evening is really very timely, and it's going to consider the relevance of the modern Commonwealth, both to the UK and to the other 51 member states. The issues I would like to be able to go through, again, if we've got time, is how is the Commonwealth organised? What's held it together for so long? How successful has it been in escaping from the shadow of the British Empire? Has it succeeded in becoming its own organisation based on shared values rather than simply having a shared history? How important is the Queen's role as the head of the Commonwealth? And does the likely official announcement of Prince Charles as her eventual, uh, her eventual successor, what does that signify? And the Queen, of course, today has spoken of her desire to see him as succeeding her. We'll look at the last few years for the Commonwealth. They've been quite troubled ones. Uh, we'll ask whether it's realistic that it might be able to regroup and even have its fortunes reversed. And then we'll look at the Commonwealth in the co context of Brexit. So it's quite a lot to get through. I hope we get through all of that. Um, the panel, let me introduce them. Uh, to my left is Philip Murphy, who is the director of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies and professor of British and Commonwealth history at the University of London. His new book, which you'll have seen outside, please do buy, is The Empire's New Clothes, The Myth of the Commonwealth. You can see where he's coming from. And he's also co-editor of the Journal of Imperial and Commonwealth History. <laughs> Helen Clark was the Prime Minister of New Zealand from 1999 to 2008. Uh, the country's fifth longest serving prime minister and the second woman to hold that office. She was then administrator of the United Nations Development Programme from 2009 to 2017. Paul Boateng is a former British High Commissioner to South Africa, a uh, former MP, cabinet minister and civil rights lawyer. He's now a member of the House of Lords and a trustee of the Planet Earth Institute. Um, we're not going to have opening speeches. We're just going to uh, jump straight in. But I wonder if I could ask you all, just to, just to start, if you could make the case for and against the modern-day Commonwealth. What purpose does it serve now? 
And what is it, does it serve a modern purpose in a sense, or is it really a relic of the British Empire? Helen, can I get you to start? <laughs> Well, speaking as a Kiwi uh, and for a small country, isolated country uh, geographically, uh, which didn't have any significant uh, diplomatic representation in Africa or the Caribbean when I was PM, uh, and very little now, uh, the Commonwealth was our window on sub-Saharan Africa, albeit Anglophone Africa, and also on the Caribbean. Uh, so. You know, there are many international meetings one goes to as a head of government or your ministers uh, go to. Uh, but for us, the Commonwealth gave us exposure and, and uh, ability to connect uh, to a part of the world that otherwise we would have not have been uh, particularly uh, connected to. I was, of course, you know, well aware of the, the common ties, language, common parliamentary systems in many cases, uh, rule of law. I sometimes wonder to some extent about the shared values because the Harari Declaration, I think, is a, is a very important declaration. But of course, when you come to apply it and have CMAG put some pressure mm. on, uh, people do tend to leave. Uh, the first uh, two... CMAG being the Commonwealth Ministerial Action. Group. Yes. You have to watch our act. act yes. Yeah. So, so the first two uh, Commonwealth summits I went to in Australia and then in, in Nigeria. Zimbabwe dominated the retreat for the entire time. And, and of course, as the heat came on, they left. We've seen Maldives uh, leave uh, recently. We saw the Gambia under the mm. previous uh, uh, president leave. So uh, yeah, the shared value is, I think, a bit of a question mark, but the, you know, the, the documents are good if you want a measuring stick as to uh, you know, what, what is a you know, a re reasonable governance, if, if you like. Look, in the UNDP role, I saw other aspects of the Commonwealth that I would not necessarily have noticed as a New Zealand Prime Minister. And those were the advocacy for small states. You know, 25 of the states are small island developing states with very particular issues. Climate change is a huge issue. Commonwealth Voice has been important on that. Uh, trade is an issue for the small island developing states. Access to concessional finance because uh, many of them have become middle-income countries, so they don't get concessional lending from the development banks anymore. But when the major storm comes along and wipes out Dominica for the second time in four years, you can't borrow commercially. You have to have uh, concessional lending. And so the Commonwealth joined with UNDP, CARICOM, the Caribbean Community, Pacific <laughs> Islands Forum, OECD, uh, Development Assistance Committee, really trying to advocate with the banks to do something about this. So I saw that you know the advocacy value on development issues, uh, particularly for the small island developing states, but also for uh, least developed countries uh, as, as well. Okay. Paul Boateng, would you share Helen Clark's sentiments? Um, look, I don't see it as a relic of empire, but it is a product of empire. So what? Mm. We're all products of empire. You're a product of empire. Mm. You're a product of empire. You're a product. We're all products of empire. Uh, we are all uh, shaped and influenced by a history. And the exciting thing for me about the Commonwealth is that it is a shared history for good and for ill. And I think the important thing is to learn the lessons of that and then to make of that something that is positive and forward-looking. And that's what, uh, for me, is the ongoing and continuing agenda of the Commonwealth. I've lived it. I've lived it as a small uh, child growing up uh, uh, in the Gold Coast and the, uh, when we had uh, an, uh, an empire and were part of an empire, growing up then in Ghana and then growing up uh, uh, in uh, the uh, UK. So I've lived it. As a child, I've lived it as a, uh, a politician, an activist, and I've lived it as, as a diplomat. And in all those different forms, uh, my approach to it is how useful can it be? How useful is it being? It was very useful, I found, as an activist during the struggle against apartheid. Mm, correct. Uh, then, it, for me, the Commonwealth and shared values and, above all, shared aspirations. Because, I mean, I agree uh, with Helen. There is a question mark over the values. Mm. But the aspirations are very clear. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and give you, give you a, an, an example. Uh, I, I was, and, and I have been working uh, because I chair something called the African Enterprise Challenge Fund, which is a multi-donor fund uh, for agriculture and renewable energy in Africa to help small and medium-sized farmers in rural communities. So I was working in Zim. Uh, I was on holiday in the Maldives. In both countries, talking to folk, they were both aware that they, and these were just, these were, were not political people. They were people who one met in the course of work and in the course of holiday. Uh, so it was essentially, I can tell you, as I'm going to make a secret about it, a taxi driver, it always is, and a waiter. Mm-hmm. And what both of them said, with a degree of disaffection in relation to their own governments, was, we wish we were part of the Commonwealth. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm prepared to tell you and bet with with you, I'm a supporter of the UN, but I can tell you nobody, a taxi driver or waiter ever says, you know, I wish, you know, I wish the UN, we were, they don't say it. Mm. (laughs) So for me, that's the value uh, of uh, the uh, Commonwealth, a product, but not a relic. Mm. Fascinating. Mm. Philip Murphy. Uh, Let me say just a, to begin with, um, you know, my, my book comes out today. Obviously, I'm trying to plug, plug my book. It, but it, it's, it's a very personal account. It's a polemical account. The, the really major piece of research that my institute, the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, has done on the, the Commonwealth uh, in recent years, which was funded by a large grant from the HRC, was something we called the Commonwealth Oral History Project. Mm. And we were able to interview about... 70, more than 70, major figures in the history of the Commonwealth since the creation of the Secretariat in 1965. Um, Foreign ministers, prime ministers, secretary generals, members, senior members of civil society organizations. Uh, All of those transcripts are available free online on the Institute website. It's a fantastic resource. And I I would say, okay, I, I have a personal view if you want a kind of a broader view of the, the benefits that people have found in the Commonwealth, go to, go to those very rich interviews. I mean, I, I would say, of course, the Commonwealth has changed radically. I came to the Institute as a, as a conventional academic historian nearly 10 years ago, and I realised that being a historian is subversive in itself when you're dealing with the Commonwealth. They, they rather like to reinvent themselves periodically and almost... Uh, almost deny that the, the history exists uh, and that, that history growing from empire. And sometimes it's subversive even to have a memory of about five years or three years or two years, given some of the recent things that have happened in the Commonwealth. But, I mean, let's, let's take the, the longer view. It moves from being something of immense importance to Great Britain. In, you know, in, in the early 50s, Britain did about 50% of its trade with the Commonwealth. It is now less than 10%. Um, it, it, it was still a major prop of, or the British hoped it'd be a prop of, of, of great power status. Citizenship, you know, a quarter of the world's population up until 1981 were classified as British subjects. That link actually, that link actually meant something. By, by the early 60s, British ministers and officials are saying, what on earth are we going to do with the Commonwealth? as all of those things gradually fell away. And they, they, I think the, the British had never really come up with much of an answer. The, the answer that was provided from the 60s onwards was provided by people like Kwame Nkrumah and Julius Nyerere, that the purpose of the Commonwealth was to continue decolonization where decolonization had stalled, i.e. in southern Africa. But I wonder, because you're so steeped in yeah, it that yeah. we're getting a history yeah, here, yeah. I want to know what yeah. you think about it now. I think it's, uh, since, it le- since it lost the apartheid issue, which was its great crusade, it has struggled to find an alternative because that was so, it was so visceral. It was like a body trying to achieve a lost limb. So in the 90s, there's an attempt with John Major to um, uh, actually making a positive view, to reinvent it. As a, as, a, as a values-based organisation. And as, as Helen has said, actually, that's been rather difficult to implement. And I've seen that part of the book talks about the, the, the tangles 
that the Commonwealth gets into when it tries to define what those values are, and indeed, as Hans says, to, to enforce them. Mm. It's also, at the moment, shooting off in so many different directions. You know, you, you, you hear sort of speeches this week, and you think someone coming new to the organisation would say, this must be wonderful. It's, it's combating climate change, saving the rainforest, preserving world peace, ending world poverty, yeah. creating gender equality. It's a tiny organisation, underfunded. It can't really do much more than express... It, it's almost like a kind of a, a religious organisation praying for these things. That's, um, it can't... It doesn't have enforcement. It doesn't have enforcement mechanisms. And the problem is, I, I suppose, in a world, a world in which politics is increasingly symbolic, you could say that actually prayer has a value in committing people to good intentions. The problem is that even on a symbolic level, uh, you know, I witnessed this train crash of a process by which the Chogham in 2013 was held in Sri Lanka mm -hmm. under the chairmanship of office of President Rajapaksa. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as I, I said recently, in terms of symbolism, you know, that's like, the, you know, the Salvation Army appointing Oliver Reed as a goodwill ambassador. <laughs> um, it, you know, once you, if you can't even maintain the sort of the symbolism, um, and so, you know, I, I suppose my, the question that I ask in my book is, is why, when the Commonwealth seems to get a fairly effective weapon in its hands, does it so often seem to shoot itself in the foot? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think that holding it in Sri Lanka was definitely a very bad mistake. I recall uh, Sri Lanka uh, put its hand up in 2007 at the Uganda Chogham. They were lobbying mm. then, and, and certainly you know, my voice on behalf of New Zealand yeah. was saying, no, this is, this is not right, and it wasn't right in 2013 either. Yeah. It would be now, right? Yeah. It would be now. But you see, it wasn't. I, I don't think we should get hung up on that. I mean, that, what, we have, what we have to do, it seems to me, is to ask ourselves, how do we, and is it worth focusing now focusing the, the, the Commonwealth now? Mm. And is it worth seeking to uh, garner the resources to enable it to focus? Mm. Uh, uh, and my answer to, uh, uh, to that is that it is worth it. Mm. And the reason why it's worth it, it seems to me, is because simply to be able to have a safe space where it's possible for the head of the Commonwealth or the family of the head of the Commonwealth to call together people from business, from academia, from politics in every continent in the world to examine the issue of rainforest, to examine the issue uh, of biodiversity and for people to be willing to come and not feel they're going to be put in the dock, which they would feel if they were invited by any other multilateral organization, mm -hmm. and to come and to feel that they are not in a forum where actually, ultimately, it's a security council mm -hmm. that does or does not determine what happens. That is of value mm -hmm. if we choose to use it. Because all countries have equal weight. Exactly. And that is the most precious thing. In the UN, and Helen knows it's better than most because she's made the most mm. of the UN, but in the UN, its great weakness is that they don't, actually. Mm. Uh, this, uh, you know, the, the UN at one level, is, uh, is, it's the best that we've got, and I obviously support it, mm. but you see its weakness. Mm. Mm. And you see it's, and, and you see, and you see the way in which it is, it is debilitated and discredited mm. by its institutional flaws. The Commonwealth actually doesn't suffer from that. Mm. Uh, and I think we, we've got to say something that, that actually needs to be said, uh, because one of the reasons why it doesn't suffer from that is because it does have uh, this ethos. And you, you, may, you may not like it, and you may say, oh, well, it's a myth. Nations and, uh, and peoples live by myths. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah, we do, and we better fess up uh, uh, to that fact. But it is, it is not a mythical family. Mm. It is actually an actual 
family. Mm -hmm. And it is held together by a very real family. Mm. And that's why, you know, I, I, for me, the Commonwealth would die if you did not have at its heart a real family. The royal family. The royal family. Because that family, wherever they go in the Commonwealth, and they all do go at every generation, mm. I've seen that as a child, as a man, as an activist, as a minister, as a diplomat, I have seen the impact that I have been with, uh, uh, present at, waving a little flag as a little, uh, uh, mm. as a little boy uh, at the first visit uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of the Queen. Uh, the, the subject uh, 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 of uh, her speech to uh, Parliament at the second visit when she made reference to the fact that one of her ministers was, uh, was from Ghana. So I've seen it at all, at all those different stages in, in my life and seen the way the family are engaged in youth development, are engaged in biodiversity, are engaged in the environment, are engaged in being able to speak to heads of government in a way that nobody else speaks to them. But doesn't so that, that's a value. Let's use it. Yes. Uh, can, can I just interject that doesn't that then reinforce the idea that this is the Commonwealth is in fact a relic of the British Empire because it's got to be the British. It's a product. Well, why, why do you use the word relic? Are you a relic? Am I a relic? Are you a relic? But I'm not royal, Paul. No, but I mean, we're all of a certain age and we, and we are all shaped in our perception, in our attitudes by the fact that yeah. We're, yeah. we're from the yes, Commonwealth. Yes, but the point I'm I, making is that I, I, I think Paul makes a, a good point about the safe space for discussing issues. Yeah. Uh, because, the, the, you know, the UN is not at its finest moment at the moment. Uh, and you can't have the sort of discussions you have at the Commonwealth in the UN context. The UN context is very formal. In fact, I think the Commonwealth heads of government meetings have deteriorated a little bit in the sense that in the four I went to, about 90% of the time was spent in informal retreat with an open agenda. And people sat around, there were no staff in the room, there were no listening rooms, and you could speak and express, and people did, and you got to mm. know each other. Yeah. And that built a sense of you know, community as, as well. These days, the retreat seems to have shrunk to a mm. few hours, and there's more of a formal session where people are there with their plus twos and you know, reading a statement. They should junk that and go back to the retreat where people got to know mm. each other and really get their teeth into issues. I referred to Zimbabwe dominating two chogans. We spent two full days in a retreat mm. yeah. discussing those issues because there were advocates for not taking a tougher line yes. as per the Harari uh, uh, Declaration. Uh, so I see the value in the safe space. I think the the, the common language is, is is one that enables us to, to exchange very, very freely as mm. well. And then a, a, couple of, a couple of other points come to mind. Actually, the Commonwealth does get its teeth stuck into much more substantive issues than other such groupings. The Francophonie is very much language mm. and culture. The, the Lusophonie, I've never quite figured out, but I suspect much the same. Uh, I have a close friend who's now the uh, equivalent of uh, Patricia Scotland at the Ibero-American community. They don't get into tough mm. issues. The Commonwealth does get into tough issues, and the Harare Declaration and the governance platform is part of that. Uh, you know, this this uh, Chogham has quite a focus on environmental uh, issues, the Blue Ocean Charter, mm. and so on. And this again reflects the fact almost half the members are small island yeah. developing states. Yeah, and they are looking for a voice and some lift from, from here, and good on the British government you know, for, for pushing uh, this along and the plastics issues as well. Uh, it, also in terms of raising tough issues, I've been rather interested to see the way in which uh, the UK as host has picked up the LGBTI issues mm. and is very articulate on them as issues for the Commonwealth, has set up front, you know, this is, we know this is a legacy from colonial yeah. law that you, you've got this on your books, but it's time for change. Mm. And I was Joseph Muscat, in fact, included that in his speech at the opening today. Yeah. Um, he spoke about it. And I, it was interesting to watch the reaction of the other heads of government. There was well, a great was, shuffling in seats and so on. I was at the Lord's reception where the Speaker of the House of Lords dom devoted most of his speech to this issue and the need for change. Now, you know, 
this is good, that it can be got on the table. And frankly, if they went back to two-day retreats, maybe you'd have a chance in the privacy of that to actually go hammer and tongs yeah. on that. Yeah. It could be... Think, yeah. No, I, I mean, I think the problem one faces with, with something like that, with LGBT rights, is that it's one of those issues that tends to kind of divide the Commonwealth north versus south, that there are certain... It can be portrayed by... Uh, developing nations as a developed world concern. Um, and a, a number of issues tend to, tend to do that, so that when London, for example, pushes democracy, human rights, there's a tendency on some, the part of some developing states to say, well, you can't have democracy on an empty stomach. The Commonwealth should be about, about development. And ag again, um, that sort of the fact that it emerges out of empire enables people like President Jame, when he was under pressure, President Jame of, of the Gambia. Gambia, to say, you know, this is this is a case of near imperialism. Uh, I'm yeah. being got at by by the British well, the British government. So, and I, you know, I the, I, I think that you know, don't don't want to be a kind of history <laughs> nerd, no, but no. there was and, a sort and of. Paul the, is going the, to have to jump in in a minute. All right, you, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but well, the, I, I was right, going to jump. Yeah, in all right, because, yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> because it, you know, it isn't it isn't entirely a north south yeah. thing. Well, south Africa. I was just going to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, you know, That's right. Has yeah. good law, Thank and you. secondly. Yeah. Uh, India has done incredible yeah. things on yeah. transgender community, yeah. transgender look, rights. Yeah. Look, I mean, I, look, yeah. look, I'm not a historian. Yeah. Uh, I love history, yeah. but I'm not yeah. a historian. Yeah. Uh, but I am an activist, yeah. and I am a politician. Yeah. Uh, and I have to tell you that, uh, you know, it's all about, for me, it's about utility. What's going to mm. be useful? If I was gay living in Uganda. The fact that Uganda was a member of the Commonwealth would be very useful to me. Yeah. Because it enables me to have a focus for activism. Provided yeah. you survive. <laughs> well, yeah, but I can tell you that they are, from, I can tell you as an, mm. as an AIDS activist, which I am still, that they are surviving yeah. and they are campaigning. And it helps them to know that this issue is raised in the way that it is. It helps them to know that South Africa is a model, as you rightly say. I mean, look, South Africa has a better constitution on these issues of gender and sexuality yeah. and equality than we do. Yeah. Let's be very frank about that. And people are able to campaign around those issues. As constitutional as, rights. As constitutional rights. Yeah. And that's hugely precious. Yeah. But it's not just limited to South Africa, which in many ways comes from a particular special history. It's very interesting mm -hmm. that within weeks of being elected, the president of Ghana, Nana Kufuado, said that the Commonwealth was going, and Ghana were going to have to address this issue of lay, uh, lay and guess, mm -hmm. le, uh, lesbian, uh, gay. lesbian gay uh, and bisexual and transgender. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. He yeah. said it. Yeah. Nobody forced him to say it. Nobody threatened to cut off aid if he didn't say it, mm. which is a very counterproductive approach, frankly. But he said it. He said it because he knew he was coming here. Yeah. He knew this, this was an, an issue of importance to his citizens and an issue that Africa had to confront. Mm. The fact that it's now they are here, it's surfacing, is very, very powerful. And the one other thing I would say as a, as a politician I find it very helpful when I knock on doors, and I still do knock on doors, although I don't have a vote in general elections, <laughs> I'm allowed to knock on, knock on doors. I find it very useful when someone opens the door who is from the Commonwealth, and I can tell them that they can register to vote. Call me old-fashioned, I'm about increasing my party's vote. <laughs> <laughs> and I take the view that in the main, people from the Commonwealth are more likely to vote for my party than they are for any other party. And there's a reason for yes, that. Yes. So, so <laughs> as, a, as a political activist, it, uh, it's very important. And it has been very important, I have to tell you, as somebody who has had to fight in this country, as we continue to have to fight against racism and against discrimination, it's been very helpful to be able to, be able to say that black people, that ethnic minorities from the Commonwealth, have a vote from day one. 
party because political that forces, broadcast over. That, no, yeah. no, because that, that forces all the political parties who at the end of the day want votes to consider them. You know. I forgot to say right at the beginning that you will be able to ask questions. So do please hang on to those questions. I'll, you know, we'll, as you can see, the discussion is roaring along, but you will be able to jump in. But I'm going to save them for a little bit later. Um, I wonder if I can ask Philip Murphy whether, but, you know, you, you speak about the Commonwealth as being um, relatively ineffectual. Just, just sum it up that way. Is that partly because of the way it's run, the lack, a lack of resources. Can I talk? Can you talk a little bit about the actual setup of the Commonwealth yeah. the Secretariat, the role of the Secretary General versus the Chair in Office, which is a little confusing? Do they have distinct mm. roles? Yeah. Uh, does that hamper its its effectiveness? I think the Commonwealth is is the creation of a sort of big bang of British decolonisation, and the forces shaping the, the Commonwealth are, are centrifugal. So the, uh, the, the key principle tended to be in the past the complete autonomy of its member states. Um, you know, there was no kind of going backwards because this is its, its history. It's, and, but that makes it very difficult for the Commonwealth actually to cooperate effectively. Um, going right back to the creation of the Secretariat, like so many things in, in the Commonwealth's institutional infrastructure, and this is, again, quite often forgotten, the Commonwealth Secretariat wasn't the creation of the British government. The British government were rather reluctant to have some organisation which might assume executive power. Um, uh, it, was, it was the suggestion, again, of people like Nkrumah. Um, the... Uh, the aid uh, body, the CFTC, which was created in 1971, again, was, was done rather against the wishes of, of the British government. So there, there has been a tendency on the part of, uh, you know, the, uh, certainly the more powerful member states to want to keep the Commonwealth fairly weak, organisationally. And it, it then gets into a vicious circle. Um, that Diffid will say to it, well, we're going, to cut your, we're going to cut your budget because we don't really see you delivering the goods. But its budget is so small in any case, it's, very lit it's, very, it's capable of achieving very little. So it's, 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 death, by, it's death by 100 cuts. I mean, going, going back to you know, what, what Paul was talking about, the way that it can get around that is in, is in two ways. Firstly, you know, the, Com the Commonwealth is not actually afflicted by imperial nostalgia. It's afflicted by sunny Ramphal nostalgia. <laughs> um, they will, they, you know, there is a generation that will say sunny, when Sonny was in charge, you know, from 1975 to 90, he would have done this. But there is a kind of degree of, of truth in that. It, it used to be a smart organisation, and you can see this in the interviews. It, it had a flexibility that the UN didn't have. If, if a problem came up, Arnold Smith or Sonny Ramphal would look in their address book, say, we've got an expert on mining rights. Mm. Let's put it together with a developing state and see if we can help out on this issue. Um, and, and perhaps now the Commonwealth has become too slow moving, mm. too hidebound by a, 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 an agenda which is far too broad to be manageable. And you could say, if this doesn't sound awful, that that's, that's partly a result of it being too democratic, that there, there are lots of different civil society organisations that all want to get their issue on the agenda, um, so that it's pulled in, in many different directions at the same time. So the, so the Commonwealth's high point yeah. with South Africa, yeah. how much of that was down to having a dynamic leader? No. Yeah, well, it was a big. It was. It was. It, it was. It was. An, it was a central issue, um, but it, but again, people forget it was an issue that Britain found very uncomfortable. Of course. Now I don't forget it. Yeah. Because because that's right. Uh, I was one of the people demonstrating. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 outside the banks and outside uh, Number Ten uh, and mm. uh, supporting not just uh, Sonny, because I, I'm a, I mean, I'm a great fan of Sonny, yeah. but I'm also a great fan of Chief Onyoko. Yeah. I mean, let, let's be very clear. And I'm also a, a great fan of Fraser uh, 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 and uh, uh, of the, uh, the, the whole team 
of Commonwealth eminent, 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 eminent persons, mm. Annie Jaggi and others, yeah. uh, the, the, the uh, uh, former Governor General of, uh, of Barbados, mm. a whole team of people from across the continents mm. who went out and who were the focus of activism, civil society activism mm -hmm. that was focused around the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. But I agree with you, there's undoubtedly been a weakening of the Secretariat. Mm -hmm. That is undoubtedly the case, and that is partly the result of, uh, of under-resourcing. And I think it's a great mistake myself uh, to uh, see, uh, for, for Britain to have got itself in a position uh, in which the funding of the, uh, of the Commonwealth Secretariat was seen as a matter for DFID. Mm -hmm. Frankly, it's not a matter for DFID. Yeah, it's, it's a matter for the FCO, and, if any, and, and I'm not even sure it's a matter for the FCO. I think it ought primarily to be a matter for the Treasury, and I think the Treasury ought to determine, in consultation with the FCO mm -hmm. uh, and DFID, who gets it. Now, you know, hands up on that, my own administration, and the, one of which I was a part, uh, must bear its share of responsibility for that. Claire never had much time for the Commonwealth, mm -hmm. frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, she is a, a, a Claire friend, Short. Claire Short, she's a friend of mine, uh, she's a great person, but she didn't have much time for mm -hmm. the Commonwealth, mm -hmm. and she was deeply, deeply sceptical about any, any engagement with Zimbabwe at all, mm -hmm. and we're still paying the price for that to this day. That's the reality. And so I agree with you, so far as Britain is concerned, the history of the British establishment, political establishment, uh, and the civil service that underpinned it has largely been one that is deeply skeptical and wary of the Commonwealth. That is in marked contrast to the British people, the royal family, and from time to time, foreign secretaries of all parties who have tried to raise the Commonwealth standing uh, uh, in within, within government and who have found resistance from the civil service as they did so. Mm -hmm. that, oh, I, I, don't just, I don't just think it, I know it, because I have been a civil servant at a time when, when one minister was trying to raise the, the, the standing of the Commonwealth, Jack Straw. I saw w what happened mm -hmm. to him. I saw what happened to William Hague when he, did, when he sought to do a similar thing. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were contained as politicians can be contained, surprise, surprise, uh, 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 by, the, uh, by the civil service and with very damaging results. But it's not just linked to Britain. India, too, has been deeply sceptical. Yes, yeah. Deeply sceptical about the Commonwealth. India actively, whilst I was High Commissioner, um, lobbied against a higher profile intervention by the Commonwealth in Zim. We could have done with that, frankly, because the whole thing became much too polarized between Britain and Zim, and there was a role, there was a role for the Commonwealth to, to play, if it had been allowed to play it, to engage with, uh, uh, with Zimbabwe and to bring them back in. Mm -hmm. They made, mm -hmm. as you know only too well, and they made no attempt to do that whatsoever. And what was India's motivation? I have no idea. You must no. ask the Indian government for that. Okay. And, you must, and you should ask the previous uh, uh, Secretary General. Mm -hmm. But, I, but when, I, when I asked, as I did ask, it's a matter of you know, historical fact, I asked my colleague, Indian High Commissioner in South Africa, why his government was so reluctant to become, he said, it was not a priority for us. Well, it may also be a sort of strong non-aligned movement mm. position that you yeah. don't interfere in other yeah. Exactly, not affairs. a priority. And, and you can yeah. see why, yeah. because if they interfere, if, if they're seen to be interfering, mm. interfering in Zimbabwe, well, why can't people interfere in Kashmir? Yeah. You get it? Yeah. So, you know, this is hard politics. It's starting to sound like a UN debate. Now. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 and, and, and India... I, I, I don't want you to interfere yeah. there because... Yeah, because you might interfere here. Tension here, yeah. Uh, so, you know, it, it's not just... A, it's, 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 it's a complicated story. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I just wanted to ask... So that was all fascinating. You, you said uh, at one point there that there is a love of the Commonwealth or an affection for the Commonwealth yeah. among the British people. Yes. Do you really think there is? I do. Do people know what the Commonwealth is? Uh, I think. I think so. I think they do. Uh, I don't think they necessarily have a full picture of how the Secretariat is operating today. But do they? Let me give you. Let me give you. An, let me give you an example. And I think we should go to the audience quickly. Yeah, but we will. do they have? Let me give, let me give an example. Um, Britain, unlike the United States 
continues to see itself in a global context. Mm. The ordinary British person sees themselves in a global context. The ordinary American person sees, them, sees themselves only as Americans. And I don't care whether they're Republicans or Democrats, whether they support Trump or they don't, the reality of American foreign policy is actually, it's always America first. Mm. They screwed us in relation to Iraq. That's the truth of the matter. We had, a, we had a particular sense of what ought to have happened post the invasion. They had their sense. Who won out? Surprise, surprise. Mm. So, but, but, but the British people, and I'll give you, give you one example from my own personal experience uh, in South Africa. There has been a relationship uh, between the uh, uh, Mother's uh, Union uh, 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 in uh, Brighton and the Mothers' Union in East Brighton in the, in the, in the Eastern Cape that has survived uh, everything. All of the, the, the apartheid era, 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 before that, the Boer War, uh, the sanctions debate, Margaret Thatcher, the lot. And, th and, and that, is, that is because this gr the, sewing, the sewing group, these, these uh, group of ordinary women in, in Brighton, in Sussex, saw themselves as global citizens in relation to this other group of ordinary women in, in, in East Brighton, in the, in the Eastern Cape. That would, could not happen in France. It could not happen in the United States. It couldn't happen anywhere else other than in relation to uh, 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 the UK and, uh, and the wider Commonwealth. Surely we can build on that somehow. <laughs> Helen, what do you think? In New Zealand, is there, would people have a, you know, just generally, would there be a popular notion of the Commonwealth? Oh, yes, I, I think so. And, and, you know, there are iconic events like the Commonwealth Games yeah. that, uh, for a sporting country like New Zealand or probably Australia, that may be the most significant part of the Commonwealth, that, uh, you know, the, 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 the competition <laughs> that goes on there. But, you know, no, I, there is awareness and it's positive. You'll ne you won't hear people poor mouthing the Commonwealth in New Zealand. I think it is unfortunate uh, that it has been kept so short strapped of money. I think Canada's been withholding paying its dues in recent times, and Canada's a significant contributor, so that, that hurts. Uh, the funding for the technical cooperation side has been very, very run down. And Paul makes a fair point. You know, you can't leave it to Diffid to fund it because Diffid won't want to fund the Secretariat and those activities. Diffid wants to, well, it, it's in a sort of results passion, isn't it? It wants to know that if it spends money, that input will get an output and an outcome. Well, you know, for the small amount of money they're putting into the Commonwealth, they're probably spending more on the evaluation and compliance than they are on the project. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Very true. <laughs> but, but, you know, yes, it needs strong FCO advocacy for it because, you know, it, global Britain, which is starting to become even more important now to assert in the, in the sort of Brexit uh, context, uh, you know, the Commonwealth is a, a place for Britain to stand mm. uh, in, 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 this, in this new new age. And you're right, it should go to Treasury saying this is important for Britain, that this institution functions and has the, has the resources to do so properly. I'm going to throw it open to questions in just a minute, but I just want to ask Philip Murphy about um, Brexit as you bring it up. Mm. Is, you know, are we going to, how realistic is this prospect of a sort of realignment of trade and diplomacy and focus towards the Commonwealth? Not at well? all. Um, um, it's a great. I mean, it, it's interesting how Brexit didn't didn't folk, how how the Commonwealth did or didn't feature in the Brexit debate. Um, actually, it, it features rather marginally um, because the economic arguments don't stack up. There's no reason why one would increase trade with the Commonwealth by leaving the EU. I mean, Britain is still already, already has trading agreements with about 90% of non-EU Commonwealth states via, via the EU, which will all have to be renegotiated uh, when, when they leave. And there was pretty close to being unanimity amongst Commonwealth countries, unusually, 
at the time of the referendum that Britain shouldn't leave the EU, partly because the value of that relationship, Commonwealth relationship to Britain, was partly because Britain was a member of some of those powerful international organizations like the EU. It was an ally to African states on issues like the EPS. EU's agricultural policy. ACP. Um, so, but, but interesting, again, and it, and it rather goes back to this question about how the Commonwealth is viewed. The Commonwealth has become a right-wing cause now, it seems. Um, and to, to a generation of, of slightly older Commonwealth enthusiasts who remember the 60s, there was a hope that by being inside the Commonwealth would make Britain less insular, more accepting, uh, would stop Britain from kind of closing itself off. And yet, you know, the 60s, 70s was dominated by hostile attacks from the right-wing press on the Commonwealth because of its stance on Rhodesia and South Africa, but also because of Commonwealth immigration. Mm. Um, it's only latterly that the Commonwealth, because that, that immigration has been, you know, was, was, was brutally halted, um, that the right-wing tabloid press has been able to take up the Commonwealth as a great, a great cause, a great alternative to the EU. Um, and, and so how, what the kind of the British public view of the Commonwealth is, I think has changed quite considerably over time. Okay, we will stop there and we will take it up again if you're short of questions, but I'm sure you won't be. Uh, lovely, so there's a, uh, there's a microphone coming towards the gentleman there and then one here and then a lady there and then a lady there. So if we'll do it in, in yes, no, let, given that you've got the microphone, you, you're you number three. Mm -hmm. So it's one, two, three, four. And if you come from an organisation, please tell me where you're from. I'm not from an organisation. Then just ask your question. All my working life, I was a teacher. It's picking up this last point. I mean, I've been a fan of the Commonwealth all my life and always talking about it. But I've found that, on the whole, most people aren't interested. The ones who are are the only people I know whose families have come from mm. other Commonwealth countries. Yeah. And this was true of the children I taught as well in comprehensive schools. Those whose families come from the Caribbean or Africa mm we're really interested and supportive. So how do we get, you know, English, native-born English children and politicians, I've written to bishops and all sorts of people. The only person of uh, note who's been interested is Frank Field, who's great on the issue, but, but most people don't seem to be bothered. Can we do anything to, to really get some enthusiasm going? Is it a failure of education, I wonder, and <laughs> you're, you know? Hmm. Any observations? Well, when it comes I, to that I point, mean, take, of, take a, well, let's take a group. Yeah, let's take yeah, two or three, yeah. and then fine. I'll, I'll, okay, then let's. Uh, there was one. Yeah. Yes, yeah. please. Thank you. Um, I'm Paul Flather. I, I've been running a club of European universities, so I have a, a European bent. But the, the point I wanted to go back to was the question of values. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that the Commonwealth has something very special going for it, in that it is perhaps the only multilateral body that ex can expel mm. yeah. uh, a member. Yeah. And, and I really want to, I mean, you've mentioned it, but I want to reinforce mm. the point, how special mm. it is. It is true that many countries leave before, before they're yeah. expelled, <laughs> but they don't like it, mm. as I think Paul Botang has expressed. Mm. They, there's kind of regret at the citizen mm. level and at the government level, there's embarrassment. Mm. So that means there's something special going on here. If you think of the European Union, it really ought to have expelled Hungary. Yeah. It's broken all mm. the acquis. Yes, and right. it should have expelled Poland. Yeah. Um, and there, there are others that are close to, mm. to that, um, that area. So, you know, we, Fiji had to leave, Pakistan had to leave, the three that you mentioned, Gambia, mm. Zimbabwe, and Mal Maldives. Mm. I think that's a very important point. Mm. It may not do enough on values, but there's something going on there that's important. Mm. Mm. In effect, I think the, the Commonwealth can suspend, but before you get anywhere near that, there's the opportunity for the good officers work, you know, whether you bring in eminent people, you send, send the missions and try to get some sort of dialogue to, you know, support countries in trouble to, you know, to see if they can work their way uh, out of that uh, with support. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the UN's never going to expel anyone. There's no, no power for that at all. You're right. It's, it's, it's only the Commonwealth that 
really based around the Harari Declaration, yeah. uh, has the platform for at least some kind of measurement as to whether uh, a member state is living mm. up to the, the principles that were accepted as, as reasonable by the whole organisation. Um, on, on values, I mean, I, mean I, 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 I agree with Paul to, to, to this extent, that I think that one of the reasons that new countries want to join the Commonwealth is that it's almost a kite mark of respectability. Yeah. They're saying to the wider world, we have been allowed into an organisation mm. which values democracy, human, human rights, and the rule of law. Um, and that was why it was so disastrous for the Commonwealth to allow its heads of government meeting in 2013 to, to, to take, take part in, in Sri Lanka. Um, right. When, you know, the, the, even, even leaving aside the terrible events of the Civil War, you know, it was a very repressive, you know, we were providing a platform at the Institute for journalists whose lives were under threat. Um, and it, 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 was a, it, it was a terrible background, you know, in, in this attempt to sort of build an organisation around values. The values, of course, the values-based experiment is a product of the early 90s, the end of the Cold War, the end of history, when these if you like, Western values of democracy, et cetera. Don't forget, Harari also mentions free markets. Now, that's been rather forgotten uh, in the last 25 years as a sort of panacea mm -hmm. for, for the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether you, could, you would actually have such a kind of a, a trenchant attempt to create that sort of values-based organization now. I think, you know, um, it's not to say it's a bad thing, and I agree with Paul, but if you are a values-based organisation, you have to avoid giving any ammunition to those who say that it's pure hypocrisy. Mm. Paul, I'll let you come in quickly, because I saw you disagreeing, and I'll take more questions. No, I mean, I don't... I... I, I just... Um, I mean, I, maybe I, it's... it's, it's uh, I'm, just, I'm getting old, but I, I, I tend to see a value in having value-based aspirations. Mm. Mm. I mean, I'm afraid in this wicked world, I don't believe that uh, the, the lion is going to lie down with the lamb because you say it's a good thing. I, it, it, <laughs> life, isn't, life isn't like that. Mm. But I do think it's actually quite important for people to sign up to a set of aspirational mm. values, because that gives you something around which you can campaign. And that of itself is of, is of value. But I want to, to answer the, the, the very interesting point that was made about, about young people. Uh, and this is how I would, I would answer it. I think it's very difficult for parents or teachers um, to sort of determine what's gonna turn young people on. Mm. Uh, that's my experience of life, uh, uh, that, that actually young people will determine themselves what excites and, and makes them enthusiastic. What excited and made us enthusiastic uh, when we were young was the struggle against racism, mm -hmm. the, the struggle against the, Viet against the Vietnam War and imperialism. And it nuclear was weapons. And nuclear yeah. weapons, exactly. <laughs> it, 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 it was movements. Mm -hmm. Young people today have their movements mm. and we just have to let them determine how they are going to wage their struggle, but we have to, we have to see how the Commonwealth can become relevant to that. And what I see in my civil society life, and I chair the International Council of the Duke of Edinburgh's Award, Duke of Edinburgh's Award goes beyond the Commonwealth but we would delude ourselves if we didn't believe that its heart wasn't in the Commonwealth. It is. And those young people, frankly, talk to each other through their apps, uh, through the, the, the platform that doing the, the award presents for them. And at any one time, there are more than a million young people in the world who are doing the award. And they're doing it not just 
in so-called elite schools, they're doing it in prisons, they're doing it in slums in, in Harare uh, and, in, uh, and in Nairobi, they're doing it in townships in, in South Africa, and wherever they do it, they do it to the same level. So a gold, a silver, a bronze, wherever it is achieved, is achieved to the same level. The Commonwealth facilitates that. The oldest essay and the royal family facilitate that. The oldest international essay writing competition in the world is the Queen's Commonwealth essay writing competition. They are young people who are connected by being part of an international essay competition. So what we have to do at, uh, is to create platforms which young people can themselves determine are relevant to their lives, relevant to their movements, as you say, Helen, and the things they want to get onto. What would bother me, frankly, on this latest move in relation to uh, the environment and, and, and blue seas, and I fear, you know, this is one of the problems. If we simply see it as something, well, yes, we can bring the academics on board, get some scientists on board, get them talking to some politicians, maybe them getting talking to some business people, but we don't have the resource to work with teachers, to work with app makers, to work with the new technology, with social media, to enable those young people who are desperately seeking to be part of something wider than themselves, to engage in a way that links that with the Commonwealth. Do, do you follow me? So, so I think that's what we've got to try and do. I want to get some more questions in, please. Sorry. Uh, the uh, woman at the back, and um, then the woman over there. Yes, please. Um, it's more of a comment, really, um, because sort of people are wondering how people feel about the Commonwealth. And I grew up in Trinidad, and I came of age in the 80s. And about 20 years later, I was having a conversation with my father, and I found out that the Queen visited Trinidad while I was in the sixth form, and I had no recollection of it. Um, so that's one thing. But what I do remember from my teenage years is the Pope visiting Trinidad. Mm -hmm. And I also remember um, the announcement of Maurice Bishop's murder, murder which was a, a massive mm -hmm. trauma for Caribbean people. And I've always wondered how come the Commonwealth didn't intervene in the American invasion of Grenada during that incident. So it's all well and good to talk about the Commonwealth can expel a country if they misbehave. But how do you challenge America if it invades a Commonwealth country? Really interesting. OK. Woman over there. This is um, a question for Paul Botang. Um, and it's a two-part question. Uh, the first part, you may have already have um, answered it in your last um, um, comments. Um, basically, I, what I want, I, you, you emphasised uh, the involvement of the royal family and in, in the work of the Commonwealth. What I would like to know is, what exactly does the Queen do um, in her role uh, um, uh, uh, in the Commonwealth? What is the nature of her work? Um, because, as we know, um, her work in this country is surrounded with a degree of um, secrecy. So I would like to know exactly what, her, um, what she does um, in, in terms of the Commonwealth. Um, and the, the second um, part of my question is, um, which is a bit of a, 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 you know, a contradiction in terms in that the Queen is the unelected head of state in this country. And therefore, as head of the um, Commonwealth, is also an unelected head. Um, considering that the Commonwealth, in the Commonwealth's charter, it has one of its values as democracy, um, and at least 31 um, of the nations are republics, um, how do you reconcile an unelected head of state with the values of democracy? And what, in fact, are the consequences of um, Prince Charles becoming um, head of, um, mm. of the Commonwealth? Okay. When you, well, Thank you. I think that's clear mm. enough where that's coming from. Uh, and, 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 uh -huh. and let me respond if I'm... If All I'm right, right, then, yes. Um, look, uh, it seems to me, and I'm just uh, uh, an, uh, an, an observer, an occasional participant, but it seems to, but it seems to me that the Queen... Uh, operates at a number of levels. Um, at one level, she operates as a convener and as an enabler. And you see that being done 
in relation to, and I, just to give you two specific examples, uh, in relation to the royal charities. Mm -hmm. So the royal charities that work specifically on issues that frankly otherwise wouldn't get much attention. And I give you two examples, work around the blind and sight impairment, which is a, a major push uh, of uh, the Queen's Jubilee uh, uh, at work in the Commonwealth. Uh, and uh, importantly, uh, forests, uh, trees, and the, and the whole canopy uh, uh, program that, is, th that again works across the Commonwealth when people are supported in valuing trees and the, and the impact uh, of, uh, of trees uh, on the economy uh, and on people's sense of, of well-being. The fact of the matter is if you want to get people to talk about sight and the value of uh, tackling the issue of visual impairment, if you want to get people to talk in very practical ways about planting trees, the fact that the Queen is there focusing attention, helping raise money is enormously important. So that's part of the response. The other part of the response, which I think Helen, frankly, uh, who has far greater knowledge of this as a head of government than I, but I can only give you my take on it from what I've observed as a minister and, and, as, and as, as a diplomat. What's extremely valuable uh, in, in politics is knowing that, and it goes back to the safe space point mm. I make, knowing that there is a place where you can come where you can say things and it's not going to be held against you. Because in politics, even now as we speak, uh, you know, I notice there's a camera. I constantly ask myself, is, well, how is this going to be used? You know, that's, that's the reality. So to, 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 be, to know for these leaders, and I was uh, with uh, one of them just a couple of nights ago, for them to know that they're going to a place tonight, tomorrow, the day after, where they can just talk amongst their peers safely and without fear that somehow it's going to be used against them is hugely important. But what the Queen also does is to value her one-on-one -on -one relationships with those heads of state. I have been present in a country and I'm aware in particularly closely of the history following, uh, uh, following two royal visits. The most significant of, uh, of, uh, of them was the visit of the Queen uh, to Ghana at a very, very difficult stage in our history. Mm -hmm. And it made a difference that the Queen and Kwame Nkrumah danced together. <laughs> that picture is still iconographic <laughs> in, 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 in Ghana, in our, in our history, and in the history of the relationship between our two countries. That well, would not apply to, any, to anyone else. Paul, well, I'm keen to get more questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but there is the point of the fact that she's unelected. Yeah, so That's, what? Uh, no, yeah, she's yeah, the yeah, most, pop yeah, she's the most popular Helen, public Helen, figure Helen, in the country. OK. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, the, the Commonwealth elects a Secretary General. There's a lot of argy-bargy about that. Mm. Uh, it also has a, a vote on who will be the host of the Chogham, and that's always quite hotly uh, uh, contested. So, you know, the issue is, do you want another level of election as well? Uh, and I, I think the safe space is probably with leaving it uh, where it is and having it passed to Charles. And I think uh, Charles will be a different kind of head of, of the Commonwealth because he is known for taking up issues like sustainable development, yeah. which are very timely uh, these days, and for you know many of the countries facing serious ch uh, environmental challenges, climate change, desertification, biodiversity, you know, Charles speaks to them on 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 these issues. He does. So, you know, I I would let it be, and I say that as someone who is on the record as saying that New Zealand should become a republic. I doubt that it will in my lifetime, but you know, I think e even with that position, I see the value in having the head, the symbolic head of the Commonwealth, not being a contested thing that we fight over. Okay, Philip, just I, briefly. I, I, I just want to go back to that question about Grenada, because it's, very, it's a very interesting one. And of course, the reason the Commonwealth doesn't take a, a, a single view on the invasion, the American invasion, is that the Commonwealth has split. A number of Caribbean uh, countries support, support the, the invasion. But it also relates to the, the second question, which is, uh, and I'm quite sympathetic to this, 
issue around this point about secrecy. One of the things we don't know, and probably won't know for many, many years, is the, what was happening in terms of the communication between the palace and the Governor General of Grenada, I think Paul Schoon. Uh, and that sort of correspondence, you've got to remember, it's the, the relationship between the monarch and the Commonwealth is not just the headship. Mm. The Queen is, is sovereign of 16 different Commonwealth realms. She's in regular correspondence with the Governor General in those countries. That correspondence is part of those countries' history. Mm. And yet, as the Australians have found recently, the campaign has been trying to get hold of correspondence between the palace and the Governor General around the dismissal of Gough Whitlam in 1975. Mm. Mm. That correspondence is not forthcoming. Mm. This is part of our history. I think, yeah. at the very least, whether you agree or, or disagree <laughs> with the role of the yeah. royal family, there should be greater openness greater. about historical oh, no, yeah. archives. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because I, they, they, might, they might lend some very interesting, some light on, on the Grenada issue and many other issues. Yeah, but you can't have government yeah. on the basis that there can be no communication oh, no. between, uh, between uh, uh, the uh, head of government yeah. and, the, and the head of state that isn't immediately uh, no, open to after, general. You can't do that. But after Irish 30 rules. years, after 30 years. <laughs> okay, let's move on because there are more questions, rather a lot more questions. So, gentlemen, there's been waiting very patiently. The lady here. Yeah. And yes. then, yeah. 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 lady here, right. Uh, good evening, Carl Hunter and Conservative Foreign and Commonwealth Council. Uh, I think the panel has been absolutely fantastic, as have you, ma'am, so thank you. I, I grew up in the Commonwealth, and uh, an aspect of my understanding of England was formed from there, and, it, and I guess it's endured since. But when I started my business, exporting was as easy exporting to New Zealand or the West, Coast, West Africa or India as it was... Export, uh, you know, selling in, in a domestic. I remember meeting the ambassador from a, an ASEAN country uh, two weeks ago, and she said, when we look across ASEAN and we compare and contrast uh, former British colonies with former French mm. ones, there is a fundamental difference the, where the, the French came and took everything and left us with nothing, and the British left with something and gave us everything. Yeah. My question to the panel would be, if you were... England, the United Kingdom, and you were an individual writing something equivalent to a CV, it seems to me overwhelming that within that CV you would include your membership of the Commonwealth. Mm. Mm. Okay. Uh, lady down here, and then in the same row, third, uh, just here. Um, well, um don't you think making the Commonwealth um, have a bigger role is like fighting a losing battle when there's so many people, not just in Britain, but in other parts of the world who are like skeptical about globalization and everything? And Or do you think making the Commonwealth stronger would make those people um, think better about globalization and liberalization and everything like mm. that? Mm -hmm. All right, great, thank you. And uh, a question here, yes. Hi, Dr. Victoria Tevelda, um, a Labour candidate in uh, Waltham Forest. Um, I could speak at great length um, about the benefits of the Commonwealth. Um, as uh, Philip Murphy well yeah. knows, I've written a book on it. Anyone who's interested, uh, come and see me later. Um, <laughs> obviously, the membership benefits um, are related to the size of your country, the type of the country, where the country is located. Obviously, for the ABC countries, um, Australia, uh, Britain and Canada, the benefits are very different. <laughs> You know, than, than if you're a tiny, small country um, in, in, an, in a small ocean somewhere. Um, and I think it's important just to remember that all the countries that have ever left um, have sought to rejoin. Mm. And also there is a long queue of countries that would like to join. Yeah. Um, yeah. Baroness Scotland only recently um, said that she constantly has people knocking on the door who want to join. There are very real benefits. If you're kicked out or if you leave at some point, you will want to come back yeah. in. And I think the Commonwealth is a little bit a victim of its own success because one of the major benefits is the quiet diplomacy. And of course, that doesn't hit the media. That's not in the newspapers. Problems and issues that you manage to iron out behind closed doors doesn't get reported. By def definition, it, it hasn't turned into a problem yet. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of its major strengths, and we've talked about it already, um, mm -hmm. is that quiet diplomacy that goes on. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe just, just, just finally, just to point out that Commonwealth countries, you know, that's what is a third of the planet um, in terms of population. Commonwealth countries, on the whole, 
do not go to war with each other. And I think that, that pocket of peace that we have in the Commonwealth um, benefits the whole planet. Mm. Okay. And I'll take this gentleman here, actually, because we are, oh gosh, yes, we are out of time. Mm. And then quick responses. Mm. My name is Majmadar. I'm a UK citizen, born and brought up in Commonwealth country, jewel of the crown, India. <laughs> but unfortunately for me, it's not a question, but a, one or two comments about Paul Burton, because he has grown up in Commonwealth country or ex-colonial country. I grew up the same thing. His experience has produced him to a different person than I have become. To start off, when India was uh, struggling to attain its independence, we got told again and again that you are not ready, you are not fit again. At that time already, a number of countries had attained some kind of self dependence good government. And we, we couldn't understand how Canada, Australia, uh, New Zealand got some self-governance where we didn't get it. We were told, or were led to believe, they were kith and kins, and we are not. That's how we received that thing. Second point, and I'm pointedly... I'll ask you to make it brief, please, sir, because we are brief. running out. Thank you. What Paul Botan has become apparently a royalist. I've been... <laughs> 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 Um, <laughs> do you want to come back to that? Helen, go on. Well, well, I, I was just going to come in on the small state yeah, um, right. point that was made uh, from over here. That, And it's interesting, you mentioned the APC countries and you didn't put NZ on the end of that. <laughs> because New Zealand is a small country, and I come back to the point I made at the very beginning, that when you're a small country, you can really lack visibility in something mm. as large as the UN. But in the Commonwealth... You know, it, it is a network where your voice is, is, is amplified. Uh, and you know, there are so many common Commonwealth institutions. I mean, it's kind of interesting hearing people reflect on what do people know about the Commonwealth. People know different things. Mm. Sports people follow the games. In my country, there's sometimes we win the annual Commonwealth Literary Prize. Yeah. So the authors are plugged into it. The youth councils uh, affiliate yeah. in. Uh, Carl Wright, who's sitting in the front row, has done a tremendous job founding uh, the Commonwealth Local Government Forum, which our people have played a very, very uh, active, active role on. And, and I could go on and on about all these spin-offs mm. from the Commonwealth, which do link uh, different, different sectors of, of society, mm. if you like, into, into its uh, workings. And I think the, the other important point that has emerged in the discussion is that it, it is a club that people do want to be in. You're absolutely right. Those who go, eventually the wheel comes round and Zimbabwe will try to come back. I'm not sure whether Gambia's already back, but it, it clearly uh, clearly should be. And, and, and Sri Lanka went through its bad, bad moment, never left, but you know, now mm. can uh, hold its head high. And one thing we haven't highlighted is the role of the Commonwealth on elections, because the mm. Commonwealth mm. is almost always a, an observer uh, when an election looks like being even vaguely, vaguely difficult, and even when it's not, there's just been a mission. I know the Kiwi's been on for the Sierra Leone presidential elections, but but that is also a valuable role and consistent with the Harare Declaration and taking an interest in the quality of governance. Yeah. Okay, great, Philip. But just just to say it's lovely to see Victoria Develt. Um, <laughs> uh, when I when I arrived at the Commonwealth Institute of Commonwealth Studies, doing relatively little about the Commonwealth. I learned a huge amount from Victoria, and I highly recommend that people buy her book. Uh, wow, so, too uh, <laughs> But, but um, uh, the, you know, Victoria sort of spells out all the positives, and she mentioned quiet diplomacy, which was a term banded around a lot by the previous Secretary General, and sometimes the diplomacy seemed to be so oh, quiet wow. <laughs> that one wondered whether it was going on at all, and it became a little bit like the question of whether the the light in the fridge goes out when you close the door or not. It was a sort of a, a great mystery. Um, but, but uh, you know, more seriously, there is, a, there is a symbolic significance in the fact that 53 nations 
relate to each other, not through ambassadors, but through high commissioners. Mm -hmm. This, again, a suggestion that they are part of the family. And if international relations is about mood music, that is very positive mood music, mm -hmm. uh, whatever else goes on. But again, it's important that the symbolism isn't, isn't, dam is, isn't, isn't damaged um, by, by poor decisions, which attract a lot of, a lot of attention. Very, very quickly, the, the young people, and it goes back to the, the very interesting question about what young people should be taught. I rather hoped when the Charter came out, because the Charter is a rather empty document, one could say, in two, when it came out in 2013, signed in terribly bad faith by a lot of governments. But one thinks about Charter 77 in Europe, which was also signed in bad faith mm. by uh, Eastern European governments, but it was taken up at a popular level. And one would like the Commonwealth to be a, a subversive organisation, mm -hmm. there to be sort of Commonwealth clubs around the Commonwealth, actually, you know, confronting their governments, trying to hold them to account. Mm -hmm. I don't see this, but that would be a very positive outcome. Mm -hmm. okay. Paul, we'll give you the last word. <laughs> <laughs> um, look. I don't want to get hung up on this royal thing. <laughs> I, I am first and foremost a utilitarian. I believe the royal family serve a very useful and worthwhile purpose within the Commonwealth and within the uh, United Kingdom. But hey, you know, I'm a privy councillor. Uh, I'm a lord. Uh, uh, is the Pope a Catholic? Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, of course, uh, of course, uh, uh, of course I believe uh, that the royal family has an important role uh, to play. But you should read what uh, Jinnah uh, uh, and uh, what Nehru uh, had to say about the Viceroy. Mm. Uh, they believed that he served a a an important function at a particular time in history, and I continue to believe that the royal family play an important part in the Commonwealth. But I really don't want to get hung up on that. I mean, that, I think, is a given, and we've seen that in the events uh, that, have, that have taken place uh, today. Prince Charles will be a very good head of the Commonwealth. Different, mm -hmm. uh, but he will be a very good head of the Commonwealth. I want to deal with the much more important points uh, that, have been, that, that, have, that have been raised uh, by way of a challenge, and a challenge which we have to respond to, about globalization. Mm. I take the view, frankly, uh, that uh, the widespread public disenchantment with globalization is something that we have to take very seriously indeed. And the reason why the public are so disenchanted with globalization is because they feel shortchanged by globalization. Mm. Because globalization has, in fact, benefited a relatively small number of people globally. Mm. <laughs> it has not, in fact, been shown to uh, benefit uh, the mass of the people globally. And those of us who say glibly that it has and that we, and that we should all just wake up and learn, and learn to accept it, I think miss the point. And so for me, as an activist, and as, and as, as a Commonwealth activist, I'm, ve I'm very glad that one of the themes of uh, this particular gathering has been creating not just a more prosperous future, but a more equal mm. Commonwealth. Mm. Because I think unless we address the equality issue in terms of economic development, we will go on finding that people are deeply disenchanted with globalization. So we need to make global multilateral organizations work better yeah. to promote equality and to promote the welfare of ordinary people, not just elites globally. Yeah. And you know, that's, that's, it seems to me, is the cause around which we have to rally. And I believe that the Commonwealth does serve a useful purpose in that regard. And I'm not alone. And I take issue mm -hmm. with the fact that people choose to join the Commonwealth because they crave respectability. I can tell you from my discussions with President Kagame and with, mm -hmm. and with his ministers, that was not why they chose to join the Commonwealth. They chose to join the Commonwealth in direct counterpoise to the Francophonie. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. In direct yeah. counterpoise. Mm. They saw the Commonwealth as representing values of mutual benefit mm. and mutual advancement, which the Francophonie doesn't, never has, and never will. Mm. 
Right, that, on that, that note. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Boateng, Helen Clark, Philip Murphy, thank you all very much. A tremendous thank panel. Thank you.